If God were to ask you, if he were to ask you, ask for anything and I'll give it to you. Think about that. God to ask you, Kate. One million dollars. One, <laughs> one million dollars. Uh, Say, <laughs> she, she got that answer right there ready. <laughs> Family. Health and wellness, right? Hey, I love that, right? Because isn't that often how we lead, right? It's like, oh Lord, 10 million. And I would buy mama a house with that 10 million. And then, and then somewhere down the line, oh yeah, yeah. And then I would take care of pastor and you know, but this is a really awesome question. If God asked you, uh, let me take away the if, because scripturally he already does this, right? We know that Jesus said, ask, seek, knock. So the question is alive from our Lord. Ask, and I will give you anything. Take an inventory of your answers. Uh, I assure you, none of them are really wrong because they come up from your heart. For the most part, none of them are wrong. Uh, I don't know. There may be some people that are like, I wish he would wrap this up. <laughs> I want to share with you um, uh, some scripture and then some personal time with, uh, with God that I've had in, in my, my short walk uh, that absolutely changed my life. Like just, you know, I think the world calls them light bulb moments. And it was something when these moments happen, uh, and I've had several of them, there's something that I never, ever forget. Like I can draw from like forever. And they're not every day. They're salted in here or there, but they're, they're, they're so, so powerful. Uh, I shared last week in scripture when Jesus took Peter, James, and John you know, up the mountain. He was transfigured. He was talking to Moses and Elijah. The disciples were sleeping. Bible says literally they were heavy with sleep in the presence of the Lord. <laughs> That's the way I was this morning about four o'clock. And they, uh, I thought it was so interesting that to, to think why was Jesus talking about talking with Moses and Elijah? And, you know, it, it's, you know, in, the, in this beautiful little nutshell, it's these two patriarchs of the Old Testament, one who drew people out to prepare and, 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 and learn about the Lord. The other one's prophesying about the Savior to come and then the Savior himself. All three of them are talking about, hey, what's about to happen right now? Like they're just like an absolute glory transfigured into this spiritual glory around them that they're like, this, this is about to happen. Like everything that was prophesied is about to happen. I just could hear that conversation between those between Jesus and Moses and Elijah. And then, you know, the, these other guys wake up out of their slumber. And, Lord, oh, it's so, so good that we're here <laughs> seeing this because we're going to build this tabernacle. And I, I shared what a tabernacle was, right? It's, it's a tent, like some 15 by 45 foot that they would build in the Old Testament. And then they would have the Ark of the Covenant in there. There was three sections of it. It's kind of like the parking lot out there, right? It's, it's, the, it's just the outer court. And then, and then the foyer out there would be like the, the holy place. And then inside these doors, through the veil of the doors, is, this is the holiest of holy places, right? And they're saying, let's set this natural structure up to represent you know, th th what, what we're seeing here in the conversation that they were actually having, we're saying that's no longer needed. So the time has come the, that you don't have to build up these holy structures. That's no longer needed. And Jesus was going, man, this is so, this is so awesome. I'm sure he said, man, to Moses and Elijah too. He's like, bros, what's up, bros? And he was saying that. And, and yet natural men were going, we got to do this on tradition. So again, back to what, what, what happened you know, with me in these moments, um, because it's all about me right now. <laughs> um, because that's what Jesus said, it's all about you. <laughs> and this, this time that I had with the Lord, this one specific time, 
I, I was thinking and I was reading in, in, in first, uh, first Kings uh, chapter 3. Uh, write that down on the tablet of your heart and, and you can study later. You can open up your Bible um, if you'd like to, to go there as well. But first Kings chapter three, there's a, there's a young man, uh, a wise, wise man. Um, but not at that time, Solomon, if you've ever, uh, read the book of Proverbs, Solomon is the author of many of those Proverbs. I love that breaking that word down pro verb. Now, when you look at the literal, you know, uh, definition of it, it talks about, you know, wise saints, but I look about it, pro verb. What is verb? Action. action. I'm pro action. That's that's I'm a pro. <laughs> right. So he, he wrote these he wrote these things. But in, in his in his youth, so the king, his father, David, a fighter, we know his story, the, the miraculous things that he went through, some of the the very natural things and decisions that he made. We can relate to, you know, um, murder, not me so much, but in the mind. Yeah, I've really killed some people. Um, and and but thank God he is merciful to my unrighteousness and my lawless deeds and sins. He remembers no more. You got to remind yourself that every once in a while, uh, you know, uh, adultery, never, never done it. Mm, my bad. See, adultery happens in the heart. You said that with your wife right there in the congregation? <laughs> yeah, I did. See, when you can start, come, start knowing this stuff, it's not like you're condoning that negative thought or action. But again, Hebrews 8.12 says you really need to have an understanding that God, when he looks at you with, through the lenses of love and grace, that your unrighteousness, meaning when you do things that aren't in right standing with God, that he is merciful to your unrighteousness and that those sins he remembers no more. That's what Jesus and Moses and Elijah were talking about that. See, these people are still doing things, religious things and all these stuff, and they're still sinning and offering up, you know, all these, these offerings for, for the atonement of sins. And, you know, they have to do all they have to perform to get. And Jesus was like, man, this is about to end. And it did. But yet here we are 2,000, 22 years later, and we're still beating ourselves up for sinful things. And so I know what to do when, I, when, I, when those thoughts come in, right? They're not coming out of the, my heart. They're coming out of this broken world. See, the devil will put things out in front of you to, to kind of, um, not kind of, he really just is like, I'm going to lure you in. Temptation literally is defined like a lure. It actually gives a, an analogy of a, of a fishing lure. I can relate to that. I can relate to that. So I was reading about this, this Solomon and 1 Kings uh, verse, chapter 3, verse 5, God says, ask, what shall I give you? See, he's asking this question, but Solomon had some heavy stuff going on. King David, you know, he was to build the house of God. You know, he was a warrior. Right. He had a heart in, in, in his mind to want to build this tabernacle in this 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 city of God. But but God said, you got blood on your hands. I used you for this. But your son Solomon was 18 growing up and knowing, hey, his dad said, you're, you're going to be you're going to be the king. Wow. Now, I know some 17 and 18 year olds out there are probably going to give it to me. <laughs> Why? Because they're going, yeah, I'm going to make some changes around here. How many of you ever thought that if I was president? <laughs> come on, right? It's like, if I was the governor of this place, I would be doing this. Give me the power. I've been in positions of power relative to where I was, whether it be job or whatever. And there were times I've had those moments. Yeah, give it to me. And other times I was like, oh, God, they really gave it to me. You got to deal with some stuff. What is the stuff? People. People are crazy. <laughs> nuts. Um, I could relate to Solomon's mind. He actually went to seek the Lord, knowing that he was going to do this. He went to seek the Lord. It's like something big is, is happening. I, I'm transitioning from... Being a child of the king, probably having favor and having all this stuff to now go in. Now you got, you're going to be the king. 
and you got to rule over something that was already built up and very significant in size and scope, this whole city uh, of God and, and, and now having to judge and discern people. And he's like, mm. so he went, sought the Lord, and then God came to him and, and asked him this question. All right, you're seeking me. But he said, ask, what shall I give you? Here was my light bulb moment. I was like, whoa, what is he going to say? Because I had thoughts too. One million dollars. <laughs> I'm in agreement. I'll take it. <laughs> but he said, and Solomon said, you have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. So he's saying, this is, you did all this stuff for my father. Even you've given me to him. But on this day, something was about to change. Now I know this thing that I'm supposed to do. This purpose in which probably bore witness in Solomon's heart. But the skill level that he had was like, ooh. I've, sh I've shared this before. It's like when you get promoted into something, uh, sometimes we're like that first minute that you're operating in that office of promotion, you don't feel like it. You're qualified. Let me give you an example. Marriage. You know, on the day of the ceremony when the pastor says, you may kiss the bride, you know, in that moment, everybody's cheering and officially you're married, right? In the sight of God, papers are signed in the sight of the state. Do you feel any more married that minute than you did half hour before when you're Dun, dun, da, dun. I, don't, I don't know, it's weird. I've heard so many people say, I, I don't know, do, do, you feel, do you feel married? What is marriage? I don't know. I, I feel like me, but, but something happened. I mean, we did some stuff out of love in our heart and signed some ink on a paper, and we got a couple of witnesses here, and what do, I don't feel married. Get a promotion in your job. Yesterday you were doing this, pounding nails, and the next day you're instructing people to pound nails. Do you feel promoted? Sometimes you feel like a worker still. This, this, is, this is what happens. Solomon was in this transition place. And God's saying, ask and I'll give you anything. So, He said, you know, you have continued, uh, he's talking about David, you've continued uh, to give him all these things. You've even given me as a son, but now the son is going to sit on the throne this day. And he says, now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father, David. I love this. He says, but I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or to come in. How good is that? He's acknowledging. And I'll tell you, when I was 18 years old, heck, I wasn't the king of a kingdom, but <laughs> I thought I was the king of the world, man, right? It's like that dude on Titanic, I'm the king of the world. <laughs> was that the movie? I don't know. But somewhere, somebody said that. But in their youth and exuberance, they're like, I'm, I got this. I got this. I'm ready. I'm out of my, my mama's house and my daddy's house. I'm my own man. I make my own decisions. Come on, life. Give it to me right? That wasn't his heart. Now, granted, he had a little bigger task, right? So maybe if they were saying, hey, you're in charge of the whole world, I might have thought a little different. I kind of don't think so when I was 18. <laughs> That's really crazy then. Um, and so, so Solomon says, after all of this, he said, uh, I am a little child. I do not know how to come in or to come out. And your servant is in the midst of all of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, now the answer to the question that God asked them, Solomon answers, give to your servant an understanding heart. Verse 10 goes on to say, this speech pleased the Lord. Now, some of you may have answered that question when I asked if God said to you, I'll give you anything, and you ran through some stuff. Lay that over what Solomon's answer was. 
Did anybody come up with, I want an understanding heart, Lord? Come on, Pops, you don't count. You're very <laughs> mature. You're very wise in spirit. Put yourself back in the day. Probably back in the day you were still that way, Pops. You, you're, a, you're a special, special man, and I love you. I mean that. Um, I certainly didn't. An understanding heart. Now, I want to bring up a word that I, Michael Jackson always used to say. Shama! <laughs> Come on, sister. Not even a, not even a crack. She's like, where's your, where's your mind at? Yeah, you're answering, you're still answering the question. There's a contemplative look, not a checked out look. I love church. Shama. It's actually, that was the, the Hebrew, the Hebrew uh, word Shama is translated into the English word understanding. Literally, it's translated hearing, hearing, hearing. So he's saying, give me a hearing. And what was the word after? Heart. The God dwells right here. This is the Old Testament. There was only a handful of people that heard from the Holy Spirit. King David was one of them. Solomon had communion and fellowship with the Lord. The prophets did as well, but there were, most of the people didn't have that. I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to fast forward in the new covenant, right? We're all children of God. That last song was wonderful. I'm no longer a slave to fear, but I'm a child of God. And what happens, what that truly means is that when you're a child of God and you're entering into this, this crazy world, that you, you have this beautiful journey in front of you. And that there's still very fearful things that are rooted in there, but you're not a slave to it. You are free. The scripture says who the sun set free is free indeed. This doesn't just happen and then you're, everything's, this is every single day there's things that you can get set free from. Root out fears and anxieties and challenges and all this stuff. And it all comes from one thing, the same thing that Solomon was asking for. Listen, I can't do any of this, Solomon's saying. I'm, I'm a child. I'm, basically what he's saying, he's acknowledging his maturity level. I'm 18 years old. I'm young. I don't have the experience. And now I'm going to be ruined over people that are decades my senior. Decades worth more experience. Probably on paper more qualified to do what I'm doing than, than what I'm called to do here. And he was just saying, not me. He wasn't doing a Jonah. He was going, I accept this, but I can't, I can't do this without hearing from you in my heart. Why? Because he wants to discern and hear because he knows he has to judge people and he has to judge situations and do all these things. This speech pleased God. So that is the thing that changed my life. It's like, I want to please God and in, in a nutshell, headlines, my journey is I didn't know God when I was younger and I saw people that knew a God, but I didn't have a definition. Then I was like, okay, there's probably a God, higher being, right? And then I met God through the mediator, Jesus Christ, who came and into my heart as I asked God, if you're real, come into my heart. Jesus is God. I didn't know a lot about Jesus when I asked God to come in my heart, but Jesus is God. That happened. And so the scripture says that when that happens, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells there. That was the part that, I, that I'm continuing to learn. See, most people know God. I think they, they, they you know, some people, it's like I've asked people before, when, when did you, um, you know, when did you know about God? And I've literally talked to some people who are like, I don't remember a time that I don't. I think that's awesome. Because I certainly do. <laughs> And then other people like, hey, it happened at this time of my life. Some people have like, woo, like life-altering experiences and like the heavens open up. And I think that's, that's amazing. I was at my rope's end, you know, and I said, God, come into my heart. And we did. Later, as I began to read scripture, I realized what happened. Jesus was my Lord and Savior. And as I got to, got to walking a little bit more and reading scripture, then I started getting real religious in my head. It's like, wait, when I asked God to come in my heart, I didn't ask Jesus. 
And I get on my knees, I don't know how many times at night by myself, it's like I messed up and I was like, he, he remembers my, my unrighteousness and my sins and I gotta, I gotta repent of that. And I just get down on my knees and it's like, okay, God, I know I had a conversation with you before, but I didn't include your son Jesus in this. So now I'm saying, Jesus, hi, how you doing, Jesus? Uh, who are you, Jesus? Uh, I, I was talking to God, but come into my heart. And I would just go over this thing and then pretty soon I started learning, ah, they're one. And then this, this, this third leg, the Holy Spirit was always there, but I, so I'm sharing this because this is the most beneficial thing that you as a believer could ever have. And that's an ear to the Holy Spirit. See, back then, Old Testament, people had to listen to a prophet or to a king to get judged or discerned. They didn't have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. We're under a new covenant. But most people, the Holy Spirit's way down there somewhere. Just, wow. It actually even freaks them out a little. Holy Ghost, wow. <laughs> now I'm just going to talk about God, sovereign God. And then, you know, sometimes like, oh, yeah, Jesus, a little bit more. The Holy Spirit? That's the hearing heart. This is what changed my life. I could hear a voice that I may not be ruling a kingdom, but in my daily life, I got some things going on. Holy Spirit, what do you want me to say? And I began, I'm still on this journey where I realize, okay, well, I can't bring certain things to the Holy Spirit and to the Lord because he just certainly, certainly doesn't care about, you know, should I eat a Twinkie or an apple? I mean, come on, we know it's a Twinkie. If your flesh is st strong and barking, you just got a sweet tooth, Twinkie it up, <laughs> right? But you Twinkie it up every day, and pretty soon you start blowing up when you're Twinking it up. That's the time you, Holy Spirit, what should I do? It's like, it's right in front of you. Don't eat the Twinkie. <laughs> Have something else. But I, you certainly wouldn't bring that little stuff to me. It's only when somebody passes away. How, how do I pray for them? And, oh, you know, you got to, you know, there's just monumental things. You know, I don't, I don't want to be selfish and ask for all my needs. God wants to meet your needs. He wants to furnish you with, he says he gives you all things to enjoy. Okay, I'm going to ask a question, and I want hands either way up or not up at all, whatever you're hearing. How many of you are hunters? That's not a way up hand. <laughs> so I got uh, three dudes in here that raise their hand. I I'm, gonna, I'm gonna submit to you. <laughs> What's that, brother? So I may be considered somebody that just takes walks in the woods. No, ha, ha, ha. Uh, that was the half hand. But see, even under instruction, I said either way up or not, and you're like, I'm gray. <laughs> Love you. I'm going to submit to you that every one of you are hunters. Have you ever misplaced your keys? Yeah. What do you do? Mm, yeah. yeah. You ever, ever have somebody say, hey, look at that over there. What do you do? You're hunting for focus. When I ask the question, most of you are like, I don't kill deers and elks. I'm not a hunter. You're a hunter. People, people get caught up in, 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 you know, in, in how they define stuff. But I'm talking about the principle and the spirit of what's in each and inside of each and every one of us. That we're constantly looking and hunting for something that's going to bring benefit to our life. Right? And then we'll sit on, we'll sit in the, you know, as a stake in the sand, like, well, yeah, I might hunt for my keys, but, you know, you should be thinking about you hunting for elk. That's not good. What did they ever do to you? <laughs> well, they nourished my body. <laughs> so I won't get caught into all that. It's the principle that I'm trying to point out that you are longing to gain something. You, you misplace those keys. You're not happy, but you, you look for them. Notice how I use the word misplace. How many times I hear people say, I lost my keys. Come on, if you did, you'd be driving a new car. I wouldn't go to new, you know, new fob or whatever it is, right? I mean, not, not everybody has, you know, misplaced their keys. Some people genuinely had to go find a replacement. But the point is, we're seeking. And when you have the Holy Spirit, a, a shama, an understanding heart, you will now be able to tap into that when you misplace your keys. 
See, what happens when you don't tap into the Spirit of the Lord with something like misplaced keys? You, you, immediately the enemy will start coming. Somebody else took them. <laughs> I, I shared this a few months ago. I come up to, the, to church here because I'm a pastor and I just love church and I love me some Jesus. And I love you guys. And I'm the shepherd of the flock. And, you know, so I'm coming up, praising the Lord, looking out by faith as I pray that the angels are encamped around this sanctuary as a hedge of protection. And I'm, I'm just like, oh, this is so good. And I go up to the door and pull out my keys. Where, where is it? Where's the church key? Hmm. <laughs> My wife, did she take it off my ring to give it to somebody else? And all of a sudden, my praise the Lord and look at the angels is all (laughs) real. Now I'm hunting for who took it. Who did it? See, you're a hunter one way or the other. And if it's by the spirit of the Lord and you have a hearing heart for the Holy Spirit, you can gain progress in your life. You can pause and listen. This is what Solomon was doing. Hey, I'm, I'm young. I don't know what I'm going to do. You're going to help me. I need to hear from you. And if you don't, you're still seeking to hear something, but now you're seeking whom you may destroy. Pastor, I was like, you know, give myself a self-talk. Maybe it wasn't your wife. And I'm starting to replay as I'm fumbling. the door. What am I doing? And then all of a sudden I thought, okay, I'll just get real spiritual. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Somebody will come that has a key and I'm out there in the outer court of the tabernacle. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Where, who took it? <laughs> who took it? So the end of that, you know, mystery I asked the Holy Spirit because I started to place blame and do all this stuff. I'm like, how am I going to snap into it and get all, you know, praiseworthy? And what am I talking about this morning, Holy Spirit? I'm, I'm out there in the outer court pacing back and forth. And finally, I had to stop. What are you doing? You're trying to put a lid on the steam and act like you're in peace and praying, that yeah, all things will work together for good. Who loves like, Oh, who took my keys? And then I stopped and I got a hold of myself. Shema. <laughs> it's like, Holy Spirit. And you know what I heard? <laughs> it was so good. <laughs> when you went on vacation a month ago, you took the key off your ring and handed it to your son, who said, Yes, Father, well, you're gone. I'll come up and just minister as the Lord leads. I don't, I don't feel qualified. I don't, I don't, but I'm just going to listen to the Lord. And I was so grateful. Yes, Lord, I can go on vacation. I don't have to you know, feel like I'm burdening anybody with it. And here, son, is the key. And I never got it back. Not my wife. Not somebody taking it off. Not losing it. I gave it away. But in that moment, I got crazy. Somebody else did it. How could they do this? They're keeping me from my call. I'm supposed to be here to minister from the Holy Spirit. I'm sharing this because there's not a minute that goes by that if you don't yield, if you have this opportunity to yield to the Holy Spirit, He can show you something good. He will teach you things. Thank you. Amen. Man, I just... I was just like, wow, I'm out there in the outer court still. Wow, man, it was me. It was you that did it. That's not how the Holy Spirit does it. The Holy Spirit corrects just the way God does and the way Jesus does. Shoves you in the corner, puts soap in your mouth. (laughs) No. See, this is how we're taught, right? And so this is how sometimes we don't want to come to God or or we, we want to shove soap in our own mouth. I'm so unrighteous and I'm so full of sin and I've, I've done this and the Lord, gosh, you know, how, why do you even want to look at me? Because I've done so much bad. Oh, forgive me, Lord. He already did. He sent His Son. He already did. He sent the Holy Spirit to teach you. See, the Holy Spirit's to guide, correct, instruct, 
And then when we say, yeah, I'm going to be guided or corrected or instructed, some of us don't want to do that. But the way that the Holy Spirit does is very lovingly, very gentle often, sometimes very bold and to the point because that's what you might need. Men pervert that and say, that's tough love. No, it's just get your attention. And the Holy Spirit never yells. Never yells. If your mind is so loud that you can't hear him, he's not going to try to get louder like we do. It's, the voice is there. And I just saw that image with the words, taking the key off the ring, hand it to my son, so glad, so grateful. And a couple months later, I'm like, whoa. Man, what a great, great lesson. So that was a, a changing, defining moment for me. It didn't make everything better. It gave me a touchstone or a memory or a revelation that I could draw on and go, I, I, could, I could do this. And, and what I'm talking specifically is about this scripture. It's because I realized that in the midst of all my decision making, we make tons of decisions every day. I think statistically there, people have done studies and I don't know what the number is, but they like, you make X amount of decisions a day. We're constantly making decisions. You know, I mean, subtle that we don't even think about. Reach for the door. That's a decision. Open it. Why? Because if you don't, you just smash your face on it. <laughs> so this, this, these are things that we do very subtle. And then there's some very significant things that happen. You can be in the greatest mood and you go home and the person, some one of the people that you love the absolute most are in, 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 in you're sweet. And they're sour. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden you'll be like, I was in such a good mood. <laughs> and you said this. Right? And, and the said doesn't even necessarily have to be a word. You could come home, I'll speak for some dudes, and you walk in the kitchen, and they're up against the counter, nicely tied in a bow. It's a sack of garbage. Leaning like a cholo, right up against the counter. And in the trash can, there's a nice, empty trash container. And you're so, you're so sweet, and you come home, and they didn't even say nothing, but they kind of did. And you look at this trash can. It's 10 steps, 10 steps, like through the sliding door and into the... Right? Now, chicas, I'm on your side too. You come into your beloved kitchen. You're walking in there, you're sweet. And you go, why is that cupboard door open? Why is the refrigerators open? Why is the bacon in the silverware drawer? This happens, right? Because dudes are in there, mm, me make breakfast, grab bacon, open door, get pan. But you're thinking about how you're gonna bend nails for the day. Ugh, mm, uh. And you know, you, you, leave the, you leave the refrigerator door open and the bacon didn't go in there, you know. You... Shama. And this isn't exactly coming out the way that I thought it would today, but so the title of the message is God, the ultimate guide. I want you to remember this. This is Holy Spirit cleansing right now. I, I want you to remember this. This should change your life. It's funny right now, but somebody's going to go home from church today or somebody listening and they're going to walk into their house and there's going to be a cupboard open that he or she left, or there's going to be a, a sack of trash just slumped up there, right? That's going to happen. Remember this moment, because you should be like, Shema! Let the Holy Spirit guide you, right? Because see, the enemy wants to take you off course. The Holy Spirit wants to course correct. Man, that's, that's good. Um, God is the ultimate guide. And we know the Holy Trinity, God, the father, the son, and the Holy spirit. See, it's three parts. Scripture says that God created you as three parts. I've shared this so many times. I'm going to keep sharing it. 
You are a spirit. You should be looking in the mirror and go, I see a spirit. You are a spirit. You have a soul, and both of them reside in a body. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. See, we don't look at that often because, see, we, we live in this natural realm, and, and we, we judge and base and feel things according to often our five senses, which appeal to the body that also are linked to the soul, right? And so what happens is the fact that we see things like this trash lumped up there, and all of a sudden that speaks to your, your soul, and you're like, but you're if you lead with the spirit see this is the this is i had a wonderful conversation with my brother mark the other day and we were talking about balance and i shared to him i believe that every sermon as i yield to the lord is about balance and it's 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 it is that it is like you can't be all body like me (laughs) making sure you're awake you guys are very awake the thing is, is there's some people out there that that's all, that's the majority what they, they, they lead with. And we've all seen this, right? God, that person is good looking until they open their mouth. You're like, I never want to look at them again. <laughs> Why? Because they're just saying foul stuff and they're so messed up and so full of fear. Right? And then there's some people that are like, you know, th- this is reality. This like, oh, but they have a sweet heart. Really what they're saying is that person's ugly, but I'm going to look on the, on the inside right? It's true. I'm just saying truth. I'm just sharing truth with you, right? And see, what I'm talking about is balance. The Holy Spirit, if you lead with the Spirit all the time, by the way, you can't. That's why Jesus had to be saved, sent to save us. Why We need a Savior. From who? From ourselves. We're crazy. But you don't always have to be crazy. See, the natural, when I say that, I joke, but it's also you don't just define yourself as crazy all the time. We have moments of craziness, and that's the moments that I was highlighting, that you let your head get a hold of you. Your soul is the will, the mind, and the emotion. And if you let your soul lead, you're going to go, well, this is the way that I think. You should, if you're going to take the trash out of the trash can, you should finish the race. That's what I think. <laughs> So, but the Holy Spirit, if you give that, if you give that opportunity to lead with that, you'll start learning some stuff and it's not about them. It's about you. Amen. It's about you and what, how the Lord wants to course correct you. So I, I'm just going to power through some, some scriptures about the, about the guide Jesus said this about the Holy Spirit, and this is the guide. And this is this, I, I really want to highlight everything that I've shared. This is the takeaway be led by the Spirit because you are a spirit. See, God created you in His image. The Bible says that God is spirit, and those that come to Him must worship Him, what? In spirit and in truth. This is why that sometimes we study the Bible. Study. Literally, when you look up that definition, it talks about activity of the mind. So if you're studying God with your mind, no revelation. And it's good to study the Bible, right? But you can read chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter, get through the 66 books and go back and do it again and walk away. And what did it say? Well, it said this, and you can recite it based on knowledge. What does it mean? I don't know. That means you don't have revelation. Why? Because you studied with your mind. But God is a spirit. So that lets you know that what part was active in the first Thessalonians 5.23 and how you're made up, how you're made up. See, you put your body in front of the Bible and then you opened it and you read it with your mind. And scripture literally says you cannot discern a spiritual thing with a natural mindset. Right? So what do you do? Balance. Shama. You go, Lord. I'm going to open this up and Holy Spirit, have your way. Open the curtain so that I could see Open the veil so that I can see. Give to your child an understanding heart. And do it by faith. Why do I say that? Because the first one minute, 10 minutes, or 15 minutes, it's just going to be, you have to learn, right? 
to, just to submit and put out distraction. So, J Jesus said, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or an hour from now. I don't know how this meeting's going to go. Shema. Pray. The Holy Spirit will share with you Amen. what's going to happen. It'll put you in a place so you're not attacking people. Well, they put me in this position. They play the victim role. Play the victorious role. Amen. That word guide, this means to give guidance, to lead on one's way to teach. Psalm 73, verse 1, it says, Truly God is good. Amen. And then it says, To such that are pure in heart. And when you look that up, it's like, Am I pure in heart? No. And then you start remembering your sin and I'm blemished and all that. No, what this literally means is pure. Think about it as a clean canvas. And this is what I mean when you open the Bible and read it by faith and with your spirit. The clean canvas just made it literally means this. I'm putting away the distractions. I'm getting out a clean piece of paper to write on or to draw on, an artist might say. Why would they take up something that's already cluttered if they have this image of a great drawing that they want to do? They get a clear paper or canvas to work on. This is what the scripture is saying. God is truly good to those that have a clear heart, meaning that doesn't mean your impurities and all the sins. You got that. That's why you need to go to God. What it's saying is prepare your mind, clear the things out, clear your heart out so that you can receive Right? So literally when I say write, if you had a piece of paper that you're going to write on, but it was already over a letter that somebody wrote you, you'd get all kinds of cool little designs, but you couldn't read it where it made sense. You're already, you're already writing on something that's cluttered. So he will guide you and teach you. Truly God is good, it says, to such are pure as heart. But this is so powerful. The psalmist says in verse 2 at Psalm 73, But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the, of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Literally, he's saying, God's good with a pure heart, but man, I, I stumbled. Why? Because he was focused on other people. So God is still good. But he said, I almost fell because I was thinking about them. In essence, my heart and mind were filled with what was going on in the world. So therefore, I couldn't hear with God. He said, I almost stumbled because of this. I love how the psalmist says this because this is, this is, this is what people, people are going through, right? And God wants to do good for you, but it's not that he can't. It's just there's no room for him to work because we haven't cleared out time for him. We haven't approached him in a spiritual way. We've approached him with our mind and just covered some ground, right? I checked this box and read this devotional, did this. And, and I, I really believe that most people's heart wants to hear, but they don't know how. And I'm sharing the how based on how God shared with me the how. Ask him to have a hearing heart and then listen right here, not right here, not with this, not what it feels like, not what it seems like, not what's going on, not because the trash is lumped up. You see all those things in the natural world and they have a message that they want to preach to you. And it's a fearful message and it brings up anxiety, but the Holy Spirit says, I can have you right now and teach you things with this very loving, corrective, instructive way. And then he'll show you truth, but you still have to decide. And this is what's so wonderful. It's like sailing. I've never sailed much. I'm not a sailor. I used to cuss like one. I, I can imagine that a sailor in a sailing boat wants to go from here to there, right? And there are times where you approach God by faith and it's like the wind's in your face. And if you pop up the sail, your mind, you'll go backwards. But you want to go that way. It's like, oh, Lord, I, I, I want to read your scriptures and I want to understand what you're saying. And you pop up the sail of your mind and you go backwards. Faith is this. Don't put up the sail. Row into that thing. Row, row. And you row long enough with the effort and I'm disciplined. I'm not focusing to the left or to the right or what's behind me. I want to go that way. It doesn't feel like I'm making any ground, but row, row, row. And you'll get to a point where the winds change and God will have your back and you'll be able to hear. And that will deliver you. That will deliver you from arguments. That will deliver you from lumped up trash cans <laughs> sitting there. I've gone through this so many times and I just like, like, why am I, why, why I do so, if I took a count and I looked at the plank in my own eye, 
How many times I left cupboards open, jars half, not even halfway screwed on. You know, somebody pick it up, pop. Why? Because I'm such a hurry. Just grab it and pop the lid back on. Right? How many times that I did this, but no, the one time that I see, you know, paper towels in front of a thing that I want to, like, pick up the paper towels, John. You know how. And usually when you, when you know that you're supposed to do it, it's because you have a desire for it not to be there and you wish that somebody else would do it. Pick it up. Row. Come on. Amen. You know, you're not going to hit it out of the park every time, but if you start with the little and you just, Lord, show me. I want to hear from you. So the psalmist says that. And then verse 22, he says, I was foolish and ignorant, meaning he was focusing on the people of the world. Man, I, I wasn't knowing. He said, I was like a beast before you. Rah! That's how we get, right? I can't believe you did this. <laughs> but nevertheless, I am continually with you, the psalmist says in verse 22, Psalm 73. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel. You know what counsel is? Counsel comes from the word consult, which literally means to seek information from somebody that has expertise in that particular area. And when you recognize that you're a spirit, you go to the source who is the spirit, God, because there's other spirits out there and they ain't from God. And you're listening to some spirit, fear, anger, and all that kind of stuff that make you de decide to do something that you got to back up over, right? But when you trust the Holy Spirit to guide you in God's ways, then the goodness of God can happen. And that's where Psalm 73 verse 1 goes, truly God is good, but you need to acknowledge I almost slipped up. And be like the psalmist that says, whew, man, I, I, th I thank you, Lord. And again, I, the psalmist could say, man, I thank you, Lord. I, I want to hear from you. I, I almost stumbled. I was in my not knowing, my ignorance. I almost took this path because I was focused on things of the world. I will be guided by your counsel. Psalm 32, 8 says, God says this, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. What is that? Not like a pirate. Arr. No, God's eye is how he sees things. Jeremiah 29 says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. They're to prosper you. They're for good, not evil. They're to give you a future and a hope. That's how God sees you. So when he says, I'm going to guide and teach you according to how I see it's how I see your life wanting it to be prosperous, victorious. Mm, that's good. Psalm 48, verse 14. Oh, it gives the definition of God. I love this. For this is God. What? For this is God. What's the this? <laughs> our God forever and ever. He will be our guide. Ooh, that's God. He wants to be your guide. You're reconciled to him through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said, when I leave, I'm not leaving you alone. I'm sending the comforter, the counselor, the Holy Spirit. He will consult you, teach you in things of the Lord. And this is, this is the fundamental thing with this whole message. How do you access that? Chama. <laughs> Hearing heart. Romans 8, 16 says, the Spirit of God bears witness that we are children of God, and it bears witness with our spirit. This is why sometimes people get in their head, was that God, was that you, God, or was that me? Because it sounds like my voice. Well, when you tell yourself something, it sounds like yourself. You're like, that, that's me. So when you hear this voice in there, the spirit of God bears witness with your spirit, who says something to your mind, who makes your body go in a certain direction. So it's going to sound like you, but there's a difference between being consulted in the expertise of the spiritual things of the Lord and being consulted by a natural thing, a natural feeling. This is why people do, I just feel like, That's good. I just feel like, oh, I have that tone. Sorry, I don't mean to belittle. Maybe I, don't, it's not, I just don't be moved by your feelings, man. They go up and down all the time. Remember, sweet and sour. They live together. <laughs> You, when you go to some of these places, they, would you like some sweet sauce or some sour sauce? They don't do that. They go, you want sweet and sour? <laughs> they reside together. They intermingle. Get those sauces and go, well, I'm going to take out the sweet so I don't have the sour. You can't. This is what life is like. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. I'm acting crazy. I'm just sharing with you. This is so fun. Life is so fun. You're going to be 
totally ripped mad one second, and the sweetness is there begging you to do right. And we're in the middle making a choice, and you're going to do wrong so often, but God doesn't look at that. He's merciful to your wrongness and your unrighteousness. He says, I'm merciful, meaning I'm not going to give you what you deserve. You just flip somebody else off. I'm not going to flip you off. I've heard my wife say before, she'd be praising the Lord, right? <laughs> praising the Lord while she's driving and somebody does something. She goes, you idiot. Oh, forgive me, Lord. Like sweet and sour, baby. It happens. And so maybe that's the title of the message, sweet and sour. Isaiah 58, 11. I, I, we're, I just got to get this out to, to you. The Lord will guide you continually. He'll satisfy your soul and strengthen your bones you shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Oh my goodness. Isaiah 58, 11, the Lord will guide you. Who is the Lord? The Spirit. He'll satisfy what? Your soul. This is 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 in the Old Testament. The Spirit will guide your soul and then your body will be strong. Jesus, this is good. Wow. I mean... I can't wait to watch this back. I am like getting revelation right now for my own life. This is amazing. And you will be like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. A watered garden, plant a luscious great garden and don't water it for a week in weather like this. Hmm. <laughs> Wilt. But man, when you put living water on that, it perks right up. It perks right up. And most of us know that when you see wilted plants or whatever, even some of us dudes are like, oh, she's got plants everywhere. I, I promise you there's enough guys that go around and go, well, that's kind of wilted. It needs water. You just put a little in there. And it's amazing how quick they spring up. This is how God works. This is how God works. That plant's not going, hmm, you should have watered me a week ago. I'm not going to bear any fruit for you. <laughs> they just perk right up when you put water on it. It's so good. God is so good. Proverbs 4, verse 11 I have led you in right paths so that you will not stumble, verse 12. Verse, verse 20, incline your ears to my saying. Verse 22 of Proverbs 4, they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Verse 23, keep your heart, that's where the Spirit dwells, with all diligent because out of it flow the issues of, of life. Verse 24, put away from you a, de a deceitful mouth and perverse lips far from you. What's a deceitful mouth? It's distortion. It means you're, you're a Christian, but you're like, uh, you're starting to talk about things that are worldly. It says don't get distorted and bend who you are as a spirit. Get back onto that. Don't, don't be perverse and have perverse lips from you. What does that mean? Turning aside or saying bad things, right? Because you're going to get what you, you speak about. Oh, it's so good. And finally, Proverbs 16, it says, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his step. Amen. This doesn't mean that you just, Lord, what do you want? No, you ponder the path that you want to go on and then clean and purify your heart. Clean your, okay, now what do you have to say about this? And if we would just do that and practice that over and over and over, pretty soon you're going to start seeing God move in your life. And he's always been willing to. He just can't because we're mad because people didn't take out the trash. It's just simple. Beautiful. I love you. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this word. I could go on for nine more hours. The people know that, and so do you. But I will not for the sake of time, for the sake of our day. But I thank you for this word, Lord. And I purpose in my heart that I'm just going to continue to shema, ask for an understanding or a hearing heart to hear from you. Father, I thank you that as we prepare our seeds to sow into your garden, your ministry, the seeds of finances, Father, that it is like planting a powerful seed, Lord. And today I pray specifically that this word that went forth, that even though as these people plant with the, with the mind and the heart that you're going to provide for them financially, but also rebuke the devourer for their sake. Father, that in essence, you're going to be working on their behalf. So as they sow this seed, I'm praying over their seed, Father, that as this seed, this word went forth today, this, this sower sows the word, you are the sower. 
I was the vessel. I shared what you put on my heart. So that word was sown. Father, I thank you that as they sow this financial seed today, that you work on their behalf, that they have an aha moment of this hearing from the Holy Spirit. Father, in supernatural ways that they get victory in the decisions that need to be made and all the logistics and things that they tangle their minds up with, Lord, that you will speak to them clearly and tell them where to put their foot for the next step. We praise you. We honor you and we give you glory in Jesus name. Somebody say, Amen. I love you. I love you. I love you.